Herbert Baumeister was suspected of being the I-70 Strangler, a serial killer who plagued Indiana and Ohio. He left bodies along the Interstate 70, thus the name, the I-70 Strangler. Authorities believe that from 1980 to 1996, Baumeister of Westfield, Indiana murdered up to 27 men and buried the remains on his property. Whatever knowledge Baumeister had of the missing men will never be known. Because on July 3rd, 1996, 10 days after investigators uncovered skeletal remains of at least 11 victims buried on his property, Baumeister had a husband and father of three that fled to Sarnia, Ontario, Canada, where he pulled into a park and shot himself. This is the I-70 Strangler. Herbert Richard Baumeister was born April 7, 1947, to Dr. Herbert and Elizabeth Baumeister. His father was an anesthesiologist. Soon after their last child was born, the family moved to the affluent area of Indianapolis called Washington Township. By all accounts, Herbert had a normal childhood, but when he reached adolescence, he changed. Herbert began to obsess over vile, disgusting things. He developed a macabre sense of humor and appeared to lose his ability to judge right from wrong. Rumors circulated about him urinating on his teacher's desk, and also he put a dead crow that he had found on the road on his teacher's desk as well. His peers began distancing them themselves, leery of association with his morbid behavior. In class, Baumeister was often disruptive and volatile. His teachers reached out to his parents for help. The Baumeisters also had noticed the changes in their eldest son. Baumeister sent him for a medical evaluation, which revealed that Herbert was schizophrenic and suffered from multiple personality disorder. What was done to help the boy is unclear, but it appears that Baumeisters did not seek treatment. During the 60s, ECT, or electrical convulsive therapy, was the most common treatment for schizophrenia. Those with this disease were often institutionalized, and it was accepted practice to shock unruly patients several times a day, not with hopes of curing them, but of making them more manageable for hospital staff. He continued in a public high school, maintaining his grades, but failing socially. The school's extracurricular energy was focused on sports and members of the football team, and their friends were the most popular clique. Baumeister, in awe of his tight grip, continually tried to gain their acceptance, but uh, was rejected. For him, it was all or nothing. Either he would be accepted into a group or be alone, and he finished his high school year in solitude. In 1965, Baumeister attended Indiana University. Again, he dealt with being an outcast because of his strange behavior and dropped out in his first semester. Pressured by his father, he returned in 1967 to study anatomy, but dropped out again before the semester ended. This time, however, being at, you know, a university was not a total loss. He had met Juliana Sater, a high school journalism teacher and part-time university student. They began dating and found that they had a lot in common. Besides being extremely conservative politically, they shared an entrepreneurial spirit and dreamed of owning their own business. In 1971, they married, but six months into the marriage, for unknown reasons, Baumeister's father had Herbert committed to a mental institution where he stayed for two months. Whatever happened did not ruin his marriage. Juliana was in love with her husband despite his odd behavior. Years later, the Baumeisters had three children and also opened a business, a thrift shop. While the Baumeisters were trying to fix their failing business and marriage years later, a major murder investigation was underway in Indianapolis. In 1977, Virgil Vandegraaff, a highly respected retired Marion County Sheriff, 
Hope and Vandegraaff and Associates Incorporated, a private investigation firm in Indianapolis specializing in missing person cases. In June 1994, Vandegraaff was contacted by their mother of 28-year-old Alan Broussard, who she said was missing when she last saw him. He was heading to meet his partner at a popular gay bar called Brothers. He never returned home. Almost a week later, Vandegraaff received a call from another distraught mother about her missing son. In July, Roger Godlet, 32, had left his parents' home to go to a gay bar in downtown Indianapolis, but never returned. Broussard and Godlet shared the same lifestyle, looked alike, and were near the same age. They had vanished en route to a gay bar. Vandergraaf distributed missing person cases and posters at gay bars around the city, and family members and friends of the young men and customers at gay bars were interviewed. Vandergriff learned that Godlet was last seen willingly entering a blue car with Ohio plates. Vandergriff also received a call from a gay magazine publisher who told Vandergriff that several gay men had disappeared in Indianapolis over the previous few years. Convinced that they were dealing with a serial killer, Vandergriff took his suspicions to the Indianapolis Police Department. Unfortunately, missing gay men were apparently a low priority. Possibly the men had left the area without telling the families to freely practice their gay lifestyles, quote for quote. Vandergriff also learned about an ongoing investigation into multiple murders of gay men in Ohio that began in 1989 and ended in mid-1990. Bodies had been dumped along Interstate 70 and were dubbed the I-70 murders. Four victims were from Indianapolis. Weeks after Vandegrift distributed the posters, he was contacted by a Tony, a pseudonym per his request, who said he was certain that he had spent some time with the person responsible for Goodless' disappearance. Tony said he went to the police and the FBI, but they disregarded his information. Vandergriff set up a series of interviews and a bizarre story unfolded. Tony said he was at a gay bar when he noticed another man who seemed overly captivated by missing person posters of his friend, Roger Goodlett. As he continued to watch the man, something in his eyes convinced Tony that the man had information about Goodlett's disappearance. To try to learn more, Tony introduced himself. The man said his name was Brian Smart, and he was a landscaper from Ohio. When Tony tried to bring up good lit, Smart became evasive. As the evening progressed, Smart invited Tony to join him for a swim at his house where he was temporarily living, doing landscaping for the new owners who were away. Tony agreed and got into Smart's Buick, which had Ohio plates. Tony was not familiar with northern Indianapolis, so he could not say where the house was, though he described the area as having horse ranches and large homes. He also described a split rail fence and a sign that read, Farm Something. The sign was at the front of the driveway that Smart had turned into. Tony described a large Tudor home, which he and Smart entered through a side door. He described the interior of the home as being packed with furniture and boxes. He followed Smart throughout the house and down steps to the bar and pool area. The pool area had mannequins set up all over and around the pool, with various types of clothing on them. Smart offered Tony a drink, which he turned down. Smart excused himself when he returned. He was a lot more talkative. Tony suspected that he had snorted cocaine, and at some point Smart brought up autoerotic asphyxiation, receiving sexual pleasure while choking or being choked and asked Tony to do it to him. Tony went along and choked Smart with a hose while he masturbated. Smart then said it was his turn to do it to Tony. Again, Tony went along, and as Smart began choking him, it became obvious that he was not gonna let go. Tony pretended to pass out, and Smart released the hose. When he opened his eyes, Smart became rattled and said he was scared because Tony had passed out. Tony was considerably larger than Smart, which was probably why he survived. 
He also refused drinks that Smart had prepared earlier in the evening. Smart drove Tony back to Indianapolis, and they agreed to meet again the following week. To learn more about Smart, Vandegriff arranged to have Tony and Smart followed at their second meeting, but Smart never showed up. Believing Tony's story, Vandegrift turned again to the police, but this time he contacted Mary Wilson, a detective who worked in the missing persons whom Vandegrift respected. She drove Tony to the wealthy areas outside of Indianapolis, hoping that he might recognize the house that Smart took him to, but they came up empty. Tony met uh, Smart again a year later when they happened to stop at the same bar. Tony got Smart license plate, which he gave to Wilson. She found that plate was just registered to none other than Herbert Baumeister. As Wilson discovered more about Baumeister, she agreed with Vandegriff. Tony had narrowly escaped becoming the victim of a serial killer. Wilson went to the store to confront Baumeister, telling him that he was a suspect in an investigation into several missing men. She asked that he let investigators search his home, and he refused and told her that in the future she should go through his lawyer. Wilson then went to Baumeister's wife, Juliana, telling her what she had told her husband. Hoping to get her to agree to a search, although shocked by what she heard, Juliana also refused. Next, Wilson went to the Hamilton County officials to issue a search warrant, but they refused, saying there was not enough conclusive evidence to warrant it. Baumeister appeared to suffer an emotional breakdown over the next six months. By June, Juliana had reached her limit. The Children's Bureau cancelled the contract with the save lot when she faced bankruptcy. The fairy tale that she'd be living began to dissipate as did her loyalty to her husband. The haunting image of the skeleton that her son had discovered two years earlier had not left her mind. Years prior, Baumeister did indeed bury skeletons on his property and tried to play it up as to Oh yeah, this was just, uh, this was something that my dad used to work on. She decided to file for divorce, and then she told Wilson about the skeleton. She would also let detectives search the property. Herbert and Eric were visiting Herbert's mother at Lake Wawasee. Juliana picked up the phone and called her lawyer. On June 24, 1996, Wilson and three Hamilton County officers walked into the grassy area next to Baumeister's patio. As they looked closely, they could see that the small rocks and pebbles where the Baumeister children had played were bone fragments. Forensics confirmed that they were human bones. The following day, police and firemen began excavation. Bones were everywhere, even on the neighbor's land. Early searches found 5,500 bone fragments of teeth. It was estimated that the bones were from 11 men through only four victims could be identified. Goodlitch, Stephen Hale, Richard Hamilton, and Manuel was in this. Juliana began to panic. She feared for the safety of Eric, who was with Baumeister. So did the authorities. Herbert and Juliana were in the beginning of stages of divorce. It was decided that before discoveries of the Baumeisters hit the news, Herbert would be served with the custody papers demanding that Eric be returned to Juliana. When Baumeister was served, he turned Eric over without an incident, figuring that it was just illegal maneuvering. Once the news of the bones, Baumeister vanished. On July 3rd, his body was discovered inside his car at Pioneer Park in Ontario, Canada. Baumeister apparently had shot himself in the head. He left a three-page suicide note explaining why he took his life, citing problems with his business and his failing marriage. There was no mention of the murder victims scattered across his backyard. With Juliana's help, investigators of the Ohio murders of gay men pierced together that linked Baumeister to the I-70 murders. Juliana provided receipts showing that Baumeister had traveled I-70 during the times that bodies were found along the interstate. Bodies had stopped appearing beside the highway about the time that Baumeister moved into Fox Hollow Farm, where there was plenty of land to hide them.
Hey everybody, it is Melodite63 here, so hopefully you enjoyed this video on my new mic, and uh, yeah, <laughs> anyway guys, so uh, hopefully you guys have a good day, if you're new to the Melodite family, like, comment, and subscribe, share the video with your friends, and ladies and gentlemen, most importantly, I wanted to say rest in peace to the victims, and uh, hopefully that someday their families can find peace. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, stay mellow.